Welcome to another EPIC uh, discussion. As many of you uh, know, uh, the two communities on Cyprus are in uh, negotiations uh, trying to reach a settlement uh, of their uh, inter-ethnic problem. Uh, and the, the settlement is being referred to as uh, a bizonal, bicommunal federation. This afternoon, uh, we'd uh, try to examine the meaning of bicommunalism and its consequences for Cyprus and broad, more broadly, the European Union. I have with me Dr. Klerkos Kiriagidis, uh, head of ERPIC's Law and Democracy program. We'll start uh, straight off. Uh, Klerkos, what do we mean by bicommunalism? Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation uh, to uh, speak today. I, I just want to make it clear at the outset that the views that I'm going to express today are my personal ones, and they should not be interpreted as uh, those of any organization uh, that I am uh, or have been associated with. You, you've asked me what is meant by the term bicommunalism. Uh, I would respond by saying that bicommunalism is a variation of communalism. And, and that requires us to investigate the, the meaning of the word communalism. Uh, communalism, if you open a, a dictionary and look at the, uh, the de definition of, of the word, means the organization of society at the level of the community. Uh, and applied to Cyprus, this means that uh, over the centuries, uh, the country has been organized as, as a republic and before the establishment of the republic the, the colony uh, was organized on the basis of uh, two separate communities and power vested in the imperial power during imperial days um, but power was then partly disseminated uh, down to the, the community level and in the leadership of the two communities. When the Republic of Cyprus was established in 1960, there was one material change. The British colonial rulers went up to a point, of course, but power then slipped down into these two constitutionally established communities and by extension to the two leaders of the two um, constitutionally established community. What is the essential characteristic of the Cyprus, two Cyprus communities? Yes. Well, it's, it, first of all, the, the term bicommunalism is misleading because if one traces the, the origins of the, the so-called two communities uh, going back into the Ottoman Imperial era and thereafter the British Imperial era, one sees that the, the so-called two communities were defined primarily with reference to two separate faiths, uh, Islam and Christianity. Although sometimes in the British imperial era, the two communities were defined with reference to Islam and non-Islam, the Muslims and non-Muslims. So there is very much uh, a religious uh, foundation to um, bicommunalism. As, as far as the 1960 definition of the two communities is concerned, one finds a blend of ethnicity and religion. So if I can just read to you the, the, the definitions one finds in the 1960 constitution of the Republic of Cyprus, that is. Uh, the Greek community uh, comprises all citizens of the Republic who are of Greek origin and whose mother tongue is Greek or who share the Greek cultural traditions or who are members of the Greek Orthodox Church. On the other hand, one finds that the Turkish community comprises all citizens of the Republic who are of Turkish origin and whose mother tongue is Turkish, or who share the Turkish cultural traditions, or who are Muslims. So there is a, um, a blending of ethnicity, language, and religion in the 1960 definitions of the, the two communities. And interestingly enough, uh, there is no reference to the Turkish Cypriot community or the Greek Cypriot community. There's a reference to the Greek community and the Turkish community. 
So what's wrong with, with having two communities as part of your constitutional structure? Well, if you believe in liberal democracy, you believe in the empowerment of the citizen and the um, principle of equality under the law. The fundamental problem with uh, bicommunalism is that it doesn't involve primarily the empowerment of the citizen. It involves the empowerment of two separate communities. In, in line with that division, the, um, the, the, any constitution that's built on bicommunalism ends up dividing citizens along ethno-religious lines and constitutionally coerces every single citizen into one of those two separate communities. So uh, the, the end product is a state of affairs which, which I, which I uh, define with reference to, to the four Ds. Uh, the four, first D is division. Society is divided uh, into these two communities and everything flows from that division in terms of governance, in terms of culture, in terms of uh, economics and so on. Secondly, uh, second D, is dysfunctionality. Uh, the, the, the structures of governance are inherently divided. Uh, power <coughs> is spread out to these two communities. Uh, a zero-sum game uh, sometimes and often does come into existence. The, the two communities are locked in disagreement at times and therefore you end up with dysfunctional governments. The th can I just finish very briefly? The, the, the third D is, um, is danger. The society is, is at constant risk of, uh, of discord and as we've seen in, um, unfortunately in the case of Cyprus, uh, violence. And um, the fourth D is discrimination because what bicommunalism does is that it discriminates in favour of the two communities and the members of the two communities and creates a, a culture which is um, built around Greekness and Christianity on the one hand and Turkishness and Islam on the other hand. And if you're not ethnically Greek and Greek Orthodox and not ethnically Turkish or Muslim, you're excluded and therefore um, you're, you're either um, coerced, in fact you are coerced into joining one of the two communities but you're subjected therefore to a form of institutional discrimination. But look, most, most uh, societies have divisions and uh, I mean I, I refer back to your suggestion that dysfunctionality uh, is inherent in the situation. Uh, there are pluralist societies where dysfunctionality is not inherent. Why is it inherent in the situation? Why would it be inherent in, in, the, in, the, um, in, in the Cyprus case? First of all, we do not have proper pluralism in Cyprus. The constitution is not pluralist. The constitution is dualist. Well, uh, let me back off from Cyprus. Yeah. Uh, why is it? Wh why is bicommunalism different than uh, ethnic difference or, or uh, differences in other societies, in pluralist societies? Wh what is it in? Mm. Uh, the accept is it the acceptance is it the institutionalization of what is it that makes this different in a in a liberal democracy <coughs> diversity is cherished diversity is embraced and the multi-ethnic multi-faith character of the population is recognized under a bicommunal system you have a strict division. There is a, the society is strictly divided and you are coerced, I use that phrase again, you are constitutionally coerced if you wish to be a citizen to belong to one of these two communities. So there, there is a, a division at the very essence of the, of the bicommunal sovereign state. So it's not just group rights, it's not, it's not about group rights, it's not about guaranteeing uh, the rights of a particular ethnic community uh, against abuse or whatever. You're saying it's something more. 
Well, if we take the 1960 constitutional system uh, uh, as an example, the, um, the religious groups, as it were, the Armenians, the Maronites, and the Latins were, tr were relegated to this sort of subservient, subordinate category of religious groups. And the individual members, as I understand the constitution, had to join one of the, the, the two main communities. Uh, so you, it's a, it's a, it's a, there was a peculiar system put into place there. Uh, funnily enough, uh, when, if you read the, the transcripts of um, the parliamentary proceedings in Westminster, when the Cyprus bill, as it then was, was passing through uh, the parliament, the um, one or two members of the British parliament were rather puzzled by this sort of strict bicommunal categorization of citizens. And one of those was Lord Harding, the former governor of Cyprus, and he, he, he raised a very good point in, on the floor of the House of Lords, of which he was by then a member. He asked, why on earth are we splitting people up into two communities when there are more than two communities in Cyprus? But, uh, so what, it's, it's, there's, a, there's I, an institutionalized I, division I, and an institutionalized discrimination that's built into But I need to probe, is it, does that preclude pluralism? Does that, is it, is, you know, why can't this situation be uh, turn into a pluralist democracy? Well, uh, based on bicommunalism or tricommunalism or whatever. Well, history is, is, has to be our guide here. And if we have a look at... Um, but is there something essential about it? Uh, or is it just, it never happened before? Well, <coughs> the, the, let just, let's just take the, 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 the most uh, successful uh, sovereign states do not have bicommunal structures. If you have a look at um, unsuccessful states, they tend to have bicommunal structures or um, divisions, constitutional divisions along ethnic or religious lines. Uh, in in the, the, um, the piece of, of work that I'm, I'm on, on the verge of completing, I look at some uh, interesting case studies. I, I look at, um, in alphabetical order, Bosnia. Um, I look at uh, Iraq. I look at Lebanon. I look at Nigeria. Uh, I look at Sudan. In, in all of those uh, case studies, um, the, 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 the ethno-religious divisions built into the constitutional structures have resulted in the production of uh, not necessarily failed states, but what might be called perpetually failing states. Yeah. And that's because uh, of the essential uh, dangers associated with communalism. Communalism it contains the seeds of discord, division, and possibly even the destruction uh, of a sovereign state. I, I have to read to you at this point, uh, very briefly, the, the Oxford English Dictionary definition of uh, communalism. It's very important that, that people um, in Cyprus understand the essence of, of the concept that is being paraded as the key to their constitutional future. The Oxford Dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary, defines communalism as the organization of society at the level of the community rather than the individual. So straight away we see there that there is a, um, a clash with liberal democracy, which entails the organization of individual society rights. based on the, the, the individual citizen and the empowerment of the individual citizen. But the Oxford English Dictionary goes on to observe that communalism appears to engender, and I'm quoting here, strong allegiance to one's own ethnic or religious group rather than to a society or nation as a whole. So what communalism, and by extension two forms of communalism, and thus by communalism, all uh, have a tendency to give rise to, are closed communities which look to the empowerment, the welfare and the prosperity of, of the individual community rather than the uh, prosperity, the welfare, the safety and the security of the sovereign state of which the, the two communities form part. So there is a, a, a dysfunctionality that flows from that essential uh, defect in uh, communalism. Uh, I have to add this uh, this footnote, 
Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary suggests, not surprisingly, that communalism is bound up with concepts of religious factionalism and ethnocentrism. And that's really the, the nub of the, the, okay, the problem. May, may, may I uh, <coughs> entice you to, to think of this? It, by communalism is being packaged in a federal package. And federalism is hailed as the cure of the ills, of, or at least some of the ills that you're referring to. You're not convinced that that's the case, or that it would work in that way. Well, the problem is that federalism has a pretty unfortunate track record, particularly when federalism functions within an ethno-religious framework. I call this the folly of federation. Do you need integration for federalism oh, well, to work? Well, we'll come to integration in a moment or two, but um, yes, I mean, if you look at the successful federations around the world, the ones who haven't, at least in the last 150 years or so, had civil wars, I'm thinking of Australia and the United States of America, for example, although the United States, of course, did have a civil war. Um, what you find in those two uh, case studies is a common allegiance to the flag, a common allegiance to the president, a common allegiance to the constitution, and a common allegiance to the values of the, uh, the country concerned. You've and had state building democratic. in those cases. In both cases, you've had conscious state building, yeah, yeah. a nation building. Yeah. Uh, Therefore, is that, a, is, that, is that what's missing, or is that an element that has to be there? Well, both uh, Australia and the United States Does that cut, cut, a, cut against by communalism? Absolutely, <laughs> because what Australia and the United States both have in common is that their populations are multi-ethnic and multi-faith, but there is this uh, inner core that has kept those two federations uh, together, and there, there has been a, a, a concerted effort on the part of the organs of government and by the, uh, the citizens themselves and by the schools at, at, at the base of society to create a common uh, culture. And what that means is you can be a Greek Orthodox American and go to church on Sunday. You can be, uh, belong to any faith that you wish, but you have to relegate your religious uh, affiliation to your common adherence to the flag, to the constitution, and to the constitutional values of society. With bicommunalism, right. we see the opposite. There is the, the promotion of religion, the promotion of ethnicity, right. and they have primacy over a common allegiance to the sovereign state. But again, to make it clear, but, but in, in the United States or Australia or whatever, uh, in the earlier uh, stages of, of, its, of their existence, there was less tolerance of, of differentness, of differentness. Yeah. Uh, won't things develop in a similar way, in a bicommunal? I, I'm trying to sort of yeah. touch the essence yeah. of the difference and the perhaps uh, your uh, a point of, of departure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what is it that makes it different from the early United States? Or, um, you know, the, there, there was no tolerance of color, there was no tolerance of difference in religion, there was no tolerance of a lot of things. Well, this is an interesting uh, observation. I, I reached the conclusion that uh, the Republic of Cyprus uh, today. Uh, is rather like the United States of America before the uh, civil rights revolution of the 1950s and 1960s. The Republic of Cyprus has become a deeply segregated society in different circumstances to the United States, granted. But nonetheless, it's a deeply segregated society in which citizens are divided according to race and fundamental rights are not upheld. 
Well, well, certainly that one difference is that in the United States you have affirmative action uh, in order to help minorities and certain groups and so on, and that's a temporary measure. Whereas one would uh, imagine that the the bicommunality and those these constitutional divisions in a federation like the one that's proposed for Cyprus are permanent. Yeah. Well, we uh, is that a difference? Let, 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 let's let's come to the point. The point is that what is being constructed in this uh, constitutional. Uh, building site in Nicosia is not a democratic system which is informed by democratic values and the, uh, the spirit of liberal democracy. What is being constructed in Nicosia is something in line with the requirements of Ankara going back to the 1950s. Since 1956 onwards, Turkey has demanded the implementation of bicommunalism from at least 1964 onwards, Turkey has demanded the implementation of zonality side by side with uh, bicommunalism. And what we're seeing uh, in Nicosia is really an attempt to uh, rustle up a settlement or an instrument of surrender which is on all fours with the strategic requirements and indeed the strategic demands of Turkey. So we're having a very interesting discussion about federalism, about right. democracy and democratic values, but ultimately what they're doing in Nicosia is rustling up a settlement which is in line with the undemocratic requirements and needs of Ankara. But uh, again, let me be devil's advocate for a second. I, I mean, you have the UN involved in the process. You have the Greek Cypriots, uh, uh, their leadership elected by democratic uh, processes and so on. Uh, the Turkish Cypriot leaderships, uh, leadership also allegedly uh, uh, properly elected and so on. Are all these people deluded? I mean, they're, they're uh, I mean, even Ankara would, would suggest that it's a democratic, albeit illiberal democracy, but it's, it has, uh, it holds democratic principles quite high on its, uh, you know, philosophical agenda. Well, I'm... Um, uh, you know, uh, should we not give credence to these allegations and, uh, you know, well, I'm, I'm the director of ERPIC's uh, uh, Democracy and Rule of Law program, so I have to uphold uh, democracy. But there is a dangerous side de to democracy. Uh, Plato recognized it in antiquity. He was no fan of democracy in the way that I'm a fan of democracy. Plato recognized that d democracy can lead to tyranny. Uh, our own great uh, English lawyer, Lord Hailsham, once pointed out that in the United Kingdom, at least, there was a risk of an elective dictatorship. A and Plato and Lord Hailsham together warn us that we need to be on our guard because democracy can be subverted by Democrats. There's, an, there's a third inspirational figure here. It's Judge um, uh, Damon Keith from the uh, United States uh, Court of Appeals, I think it's called. Uh, he warned us that democracies die behind closed doors. Now, that was going to lead me to this. Is, is the process that's happening yeah. now any suggestive of anything? I mean, in your mind, uh, is, is it the... Is it, um, uh, democratic enough, let's say? Well... I, I mean, the, the negotiating process. Well, the I uh, describe what we're, what we're seeing in Nicosia as a uh, surrender process uh, taking place amid the smog of secrecy. What do I mean by that? Uh, we are observing uh, from a distance um, the war aims of Turkey being implemented uh, by means of a process being conducted in complete secrecy by the two leaders of the two communities. Uh, I beg to differ With there because on the Turkish Cypriot side it seems that there is uh, a, a, a quite a, an extensive um, uh, presentation of positions and, and discussion of positions and so on. Uh, I think you may be referring to the Greek side. Uh, the Greek side, there is certainly uh, a tendency not to let on 
uh, to the extent of the things that are being discussed or the nature, the real nature of the discussions and so on. At least that's the feeling of peop that people are getting. Well, t two points there. First of all, these expressions that have tripped off your tongue are very dangerous and they're part of this doctrine of division associated with bicommunalism. You refer to the Greek side and the Turkish side. And th these are expressions that have nothing to do with liberal democracy. In a liberal democracy, the two sides are, if they exist, the citizens and the organs of government. Uh, whereas here in Cyprus, because of bicommunalism, yeah. th these phrases have entered the day-to-day -day lexicon and they're deeply divisive and they engender a form of uh, separation which is at the essence of bicommunalism. But in answer to your question, um, has there, I put it in the form of a series of questions, has there been a transparent consultation exercise carried out by anybody? In Nicosia? Well, no, there, there's, there hasn't been a constitutional uh, process. Uh, I mean, uh, in, in most countries, when they're either changing their constitution or, or creating a constitution yeah. or so on, there is, uh, in democratic states, a process by which most of the parties and most of the, the stakeholders, to use yeah. a, a, a modern uh, favorite uh, term, uh, are consulted. Yes. Uh, there seems to be that happening uh, in the fr from the point of view of the Turkish Cypriot leadership, but there doesn't uh, seem uh, to be. Hang on, I'm, I'm questioning you there because right. have documents been placed in the public domain? It's consultation papers. This is what we're proposing: A, B, C, D, E, F, G, or is it all talk? Uh, let me just let me just uh, explore this point a little bit further. Uh, democracies die behind closed doors. What is being discussed in secret, as I understand it, bearing in mind the history of the Annan plan, is the uh, composition of three constitutions, one for the proposed federation, one for the proposed Greek Cypriot constituent state, and one for the proposed Turkish Cypriot constituent state. So what we're seeing is the drafting of three constitutions, together with multiple uh, Acts of Parliament, to use an English expression, multiple legislative instruments. I ask some questions. In each of the three constitutions, how is the separation of powers going to be structured? Is there going to be a system of parliamentary supremacy? Is there going to be, a, is there going to be say, as you have in America, a Marbury and Madison uh, power built into the Supreme Court to strike down legislation? Uh, what is going to be the nature of the, the system of checks and balances? Who's going to appoint judges? Who is going to hold the, uh, the, the executive branch to account? Uh, is, the, is the head of the executive branch of government going to be kept away from the legislature? Or is he going to be like a prime minister and, and be accountable to, uh, to the legislature on a weekly uh, basis? Do we know the answers to those questions? Well, it suggests, some, there's a suggestion that in the um, a communique of uh, February of 14th 2014. Eleventh of February. Uh, February forgive there, me. There's a a suggestion that a lot of concepts and uh, European concepts, anyway, of of, uh, of democracy and so on, are subject to the concept of bicommunality. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, is that hitting the nail on the head? Is that is that what's bad about bicommunality? Is that it institutionalizes uh, a criterion mm. well, uh, or a measure of democratic principles? Well, the answer to the question is we don't know the answer to the question because no documents have been presented with the exception of the joint declaration of the 11th of February 2014. A few other bits and pieces have emerged, but not a single draft constitution has been uh, put forward. I, I would step away from big constitutional instruments and, and ask a number of, of other questions. Uh, is there going to be a charter of fundamental rights or three separate charters of fundamental rights? The Annan plan suggested there would be three charters of fundamental rights. Uh, what are those charters of fundamental rights going to contain? Will the, will the, right, the relatively new right to dignity be built into any of those three charters of fundamental rights? Will there be a constitutional guarantee of freedom of information? Will there be a Freedom of Information Act? Uh, what, take bread and butter issues, for example. How is the health service going to function? Uh, 
Have the doctors and the nurses and the healthcare professionals been consulted about how the health care legislation is going to function? Tax accountants, have the accountants been consulted about how the tax code is going to function? Again, you, know, you can't... T turning this around, I, uh, yeah. one hears <coughs> that one of the concerns of the parties in the discussions is to come up with something that there will be a, 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 an easy transition period or an easy transition from what people are used to today to the new status quo, in fact a seamless transition, uh, or better, that they wouldn't uh, be able to tell the difference. Uh, in other words, it wouldn't be this. This new settlement wouldn't be wouldn't mark a change in their lives. Well, can we see the draft legislation now, to, uh, to to fine, justify but, but that? Let's that say that on, on a theoretical suggestion. basis. Yeah. What does that suggest? That I, I mean, I, either uh, you're integrating the two communities in some way, or you're st keeping them apart. I mean, you can't do both. Well. If, if you're <laughs> trying to not to change people's lives, uh, it means that you're going to err on the side of keeping the situation as close to what it is, uh, the, in terms of separation, in terms of all these things. Uh, if you're going to you know, break the eggs into an omelet, uh, that's going to affect people's lives. I can't answer your question. No, I, I, haven't I'm just any, I haven't seen any draft documents, no, uh, sure. draft legislation, sure, draft but, but I, I'm just repeating some of the some of the, uh, <laughs> the some of the uh, suggestions or some of the uh, the spins or some of the narrative. And where where, are these, where does this spin come from, if I may ask? Uh, the, certainly the uh, the the the, uh, the media and and, and the. Uh, uh, discussions that to some point uh, are happening between in the in the Greek side uh, among the political leaders and the and the and the government and so on there's a suggestion that you know we we're trying to keep things as smooth as possible and not well, you know that this is a concern of the negotiators uh, and therefore if we're making you know, for erring on other things, uh, this is a big consideration. Well, one of the problems with bicommunalism, as I see it, is that it gives rise to what uh, Lippart called uh, governance by elite cartel. And what you're seeing in Nicosia are two cartels, or the leaders of two cartels, meeting together, cooking up something in complete secrecy. We don't know what on earth is being discussed. And there are exceptional dangers here for citizens. Let me just raise three very quick questions to, to highlight the dangers associated with drafting legislation in secret in the absence of any consultation exercises, in the absence of any proper mechanisms of accountability, and in the absence of proper transparency. Number one, what are going to be the powers of the police the law enforcement agencies and the intelligence services of the three proposed entities. Number two, what are going to be the rights of anybody arrested by any of those uh, police forces, law enforcement agencies and intelligence services? And number three, what mechanisms of judicial review will exist to enable anybody who has been arrested or subject to a potentially unlawful decision I mean, these, these are questions of enormous importance. We need to know, as citizens of, uh, I'm not a citizen of the Republic of Cyprus, but I'm a citizen of the European Union. We, as citizens of the European Union, are entitled to know the nature of the proposed powers of the law enforcement agencies. Which brings uh, us to the, to the begs the question, what are the consequences of, uh, of bicommunality uh, in uh, the adoption of the concept uh, in Cyprus to the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is this is raises an interesting question. Uh, uh, the European Union and its member states need to ask themselves some really crucial questions. Bearing in mind the principle of solidarity that is a founding principle of the European Union. And bearing in mind the impact that what happens in one part of the European Union can have adverse consequences elsewhere. I'll put it in the form of two questions. Firstly, should 
the citizens of a member state of the European Union be divided strictly into two separate ethno-religious communities? Second question is, should those two communities be constitutionally endowed with two separate zones, one of which was established as a consequence of an unlawful and unethical invasion, occupation and series of acts of ethnic cleansing, which was followed by enforced segregation. Is the future of the European Union to be built upon the principles of two communities and two zones and coexistence? Or, or more than two communities for that matter, maybe. Or is the future of the European Union and its member states going to be built upon integration, pluralism, security, the empowerment of the individual, but the curtailment of unacceptable and unlawful uh, con uh, conduct? What we're seeing here in Cyprus, I fear, is something that we may very well be seeing in France and Germany and the United Kingdom and the Netherlands and uh, Denmark and in Sweden and in other parts of the European Union. What we are seeing here is the division of people according to their ethnicity or religion, the encroachment of well, Turkey. they've divided already uh, the acceptance of that division, or well, the constitution, the institutionalization of that division. Well, the difference between Cyprus and, say, I can't speak for France or Germany because I never lived there. I, I was born and brought up in the United Kingdom, so I can, I'll, let's use the United Kingdom as an example. Uh, here in Cyprus, we have the constitutional acceptance of bicommunalism. My, my ambition in life is to see bicommunalism brought to an end. We'll, we'll maybe finish on that thought. But uh, what we have here in Cyprus is the constitutional acceptance and enforcement of two communities being kept apart by bicommunalism. And what they're trying to rustle up in Nicosia is the supplement of or the, or the uh, uh, the combination of bicommunalism with bisonality, the, the l constitutional acceptance of two zones. Let's now... Geographical expression of bicommunalism. Exactly. It's, uh, bisonality, that's why we, I've dwelt on bicommunalism, because all bisonality is, is the, as you put it, the geographical expression of bicommunalism. Although in the case of Cyprus, it's of course also a product of an invasion and occupation and ethnic cleansing. But as far as Europe is concerned, let's take the United Kingdom. There is no constitutional bicommunalism in the United Kingdom because we have a parliamentary democracy. Um, but what we're seeing in the United Kingdom is the creeping bicommunalization of the country. We're seeing self-segregation in various forms. We are seeing uh, the emergence of what the Cantle Report back in 2001 described as people inhabiting parallel lives. So what we're seeing in the United Kingdom, which is really deeply troubling, is on the one hand uh, a de facto form of bicommunalism coming into existence. And the de facto bicommunalism is being supplemented with a de facto form of bisonality. Now only time will tell whether there are moves afoot to try and uh, constitutionalize, or we don't have a, a single codified constitution, but only time will tell whether we'll, we'll have further steps taken in the direction of legalized by communalism and legalized bisonality. I hope the day will never come. What I can say is that um, for all of his many faults, and he has many faults, the Prime Minister David Cameron uh, has, seems to have woken up to, to the dangers of bicommunalism and bisonality, even though he hasn't uh, shown any interest in bicommunalism and bisonality over here, other than to, to support it. If, but and if you read the strategy papers that are published by the United Kingdom government, and I'm referring here to the integration strategy paper and the counter-extremism strategy paper, there is not a single reference to uh, coexistence. There is multiple references, or there are multiple references to integration. What the Prime Minister has realized is that, that we need to step away from division, 
step away from uh, self-segregation and try and build an integrated society under the rule of law in which everybody is equal but everybody adheres to a common set of values which are rooted in the democratic ethos and are rooted in uh, the rule of law. And I, I'm, I'm hoping uh, that within the fullness of time Mr Cameron and other British politicians will wake up and realise that if by communalism and by zonality can be killed off and consigned to history here in the Republic of Cyprus, then the chances of by communalism and by zonality seeping into the culture and into the law of the United Kingdom will be diminished. So uh, my message really to uh, my, our, we have to say our, our fellow Europeans, and the British are still just about fellow Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see whether they, <laughs> still is the key word. Uh, my message to fellow Europeans, including the British, uh, is this, help Cyprus dismantle by communalism, help Cyprus release itself from the grip of de facto bisonality, help Cyprus uh, remove uh, the Turkish troops, help Cyprus remove the unlawful colonists, help Cyprus become a liberal democracy. Because if you can help Cyprus become a liberal democracy under the rule of law, you'll be able to shore up liberal democracy and the rule of law in France, in Germany, in the United Kingdom, in Denmark, in Sweden, in Belgium, and all of the other but member states of the European surely Union. Surely the response of that, to that is this is what the parties want. This is self-segregation. They want to be different. They've otherwise, uh, you know, the, the, the two parties or at least one party would object to it. But the, the, from an official point of view, the officialdom is not objecting to this. So, uh, you know, oh, should one make the case for them? Uh, you know, th I think th that's a question that, that one needs to answer eventually. Why is this not an official, in the official debate here? It's, it's in the debate of, uh, in the societal debate, at least on the Greek side. Oh, you've used that phrase Greek side, which is naughty. I, I'm, I'm you, sorry to do that, but, but it, it expresses a reality. Look, the, the See, this is it. It's the reality of the situation in Cyprus. It, it's gone beyond yeah. just a theory or a theorem. It, it's become the reality. Look, so uh, can you backpedal history Well, uh, and, and, and integrate these two communities? Listen, um, the political... Uh, elites in Nicosia uh, are rather like drug addicts who are addicted to heroin and need to inject themselves every week or every day with things they shouldn't and they are addicted to bicommunalism. They have got so used to uh, injecting themselves with bicommunalism they, they can't release themselves from, from its grip and what they don't realize is that the bicommunalism that they are injecting themselves on a daily basis is given to them, has been given to them by Ankara and this is what Ankara wants to see and every time you hear a separate, listen to this everyone who's listening to this, every time you hear a separate politician refer to the two sides, the two communities, the two leaders, they are talking in the lexicon of division that Ankara has seeped into Cypriot society and if I can draw another analogy, um, by communalism emits the stench of segregation and the problem is that if you live next to a cesspit your nostrils and your nose becomes used to the stench and, and this is what's happened here in Cyprus people have been living with a cesspit of segregation for so long that the stench has become part of their day-to-day -day lives and they don't realize that what they need is a blast of fresh air. But this segregation, and, and I guess this is what you're saying, that it goes back beyond uh, the colonial period, it goes back into the Ottoman period and so on. Uh, so uh, people have gotten used to the idea, but it's not only Cyprus, because in other parts of the Middle East and the, East, uh, the Near East, 
that is the state of affairs. Uh, in Syria, you have these little communities of Christian communities that are now in the process of being eliminated. Uh, so I, yeah. th this is what I'm leading to. Yeah. It, it, it's um, it is perhaps one of the most insidious aspects of this ethno-religious division, this institutionalized accepted division, that it marks the victims yes. in the long term. Yes. Sooner or later, uh, these self-segregated uh, individuals or communities uh, will be subject to attack. Yeah. Well, I, I've got to make... Um, I just or is this too deterministic? Uh, I've just made a, a number of notes here. Let, you mentioned the Ottoman Empire. The Republic of Cyprus has never really been a truly independent sovereign state. And as long as bicommunalism is um, locked into the system here, Cyprus will never be independent. It will be under the shadow of Ankara, if not chained to Ankara. And what I want people uh, here in Cyprus to realize is that uh, to be independent, to be truly independent, you need to throw off the chains of bicommunalism. Everybody here in Cyprus, irrespective of race, ethnicity, or religion, should rally around democracy and the rule of law and rally around the Republic of Cyprus as a sovereign state and throw off these chains of imperialism which are still um, holding Cyprus back from becoming a liberal democracy. But even if they do that, they, you'll need to amend the, the constitution of Cyprus. And surely some argue that that's what's happening now. They're just amending uh, the, the 1960 constitution of Cyprus. Uh, and they're introducing the group rights and the group guarantees that uh, a, a particular section of the population needs in order to feel comfortable. What they're doing is, if I can use another analogy, is they're taking off chains that have rusted and they're trying to come up with fresh chains. The principle is the same, bicommunalism. You need to remove bicommunalism. Uh, and in order to do that, there needs to be a new constitutional agenda I, in this publication I'll be releasing shortly, I, I try and come up with some uh, ideas for doing that. But you need to change the procedure. The procedure has to be transparent and it has to be democratic and it has to be um, citizen-led, not leader-led, to, to, to use the phrase of Mr. Ryder, the United Nations uh, representative here. So it needs to be, uh, there needs to be a change of procedure and there needs to be a change of substance. So the objective of the process of constitutional renewal, to use another British phrase, the objective of the process of constitutional renewal should be to truly decolonize the Republic of Cyprus, to de-bicommunalize the Republic of Cyprus, and to de-zonalize the Republic of Cyprus. Simple principles. You cannot have the taking off of the rusted uh, chains and the putting on of new chains, because you'll end up with the same, same uh, r r rotten result, if I can use that phrase. Uh, there's, 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 a, there's a second point I want to really emphasize. You, you mentioned the Middle East, and you commented that, well, this is what goes on in this part of the world. This is why the European Union needs to wake up. Instead of the Eastern Mediterranean becoming liberal democratic, what we're seeing is that the European Union is gradually becoming Middle Eastern. What, I'm, what do I mean by that? I mean by that that the, uh, the European Union is accepting, here in the Republic of Cyprus, the values of the Ottoman Empire, by communalism and, of course, the bisonality that comes with it. So, really, what, what's happening here in Cyprus is going to really determine the future of Europe and the future of the Middle East. If this part of the world, this island of Cyprus, if this island of Cyprus can become a true liberal democracy under the rule of law, which respects the rights of every citizen, irrespective of, of ethnicity or religion, if this part of the world can embrace liberal democracy, then we can protect liberal democracy in the remainder of the European Union. But if this part of the world becomes 
bicommunalized and bizonalized. What that means is that the European Union is effectively creating a suicide pill which is potentially going to kill the rest of the European Union. Because mark my words, and I hope I'm wrong, I'm praying that I'm wrong, but if we bicommunalize and bizonalize the Republic of Cyprus, the enemies of liberal democracy will want to bicommunalize and bizonalize Italy and France and Germany and Sweden and Denmark and Belgium and the United Kingdom and Ireland and everywhere else. So this is why the Europeans need to wake up. I go back to those two questions I put earlier. Should the citizens of a sovereign state be divided constitutionally into two communities? My answer is no. Should the citizens of a sovereign state be, uh, have their territory carved up into two separate zones? My answer to that question is an unmistakable no. What does, where, where does that leave us? It leaves us with uh, the alternative. And the alternative, I go back to it once again, is the rule of law, liberal democracy, and the principles embodied within Practically, those. Practically, though, uh, how do you see that happening? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, uh, we're at the last stages, supposedly, of a negotiating, negotiated process. Uh, do people say, okay, uh, well, <laughs> Uh, we were uh, barking up the wrong tree, let's change trees. Uh, I mean, what, uh, how is it practical to do something like that? Um, the late great British politician Dennis Healy once said that if you find yourself uh, digging a hole, the first thing you should do is stop digging. They have dug themselves into these two bicommunal trenches and the first thing they need to do is down tools. Uh, the second thing they need to do is to uh, lay the documents in front of the, the public for the, so that the citizens can draw their own conclusions. The citizens need to know... That sounds more like a practical thing. I mean, yeah. that, that if, if uh, supposedly, uh, you know, it's the, sovereign, uh, uh, the sovereignty belongs to the people, uh, let the people speak, uh, but then what if they speak, uh, they say we like what's going on? Well then we've got to first of all, uh, well I don't want to go into the question of the, the colonists, but we need to ask Is it too for, late? Well is it too late? Um, for liberal democracy? <laughs> I don't that's know. the question for the advocates of bicommunalism and bisonality to answer. I don't want to go into detail on what's happened in, in uh, Paris and in Cologne and in other European cities in recent months, but there is a serious danger that uh, communalism is seeping into European society. I venture no comments on what Donald Trump has been saying in the United States, but his references to a temporary ban on Muslims entering the United States is a manifestation of communalism and indeed separate by communalism because what Mr. Trump is doing is he's um, drawing a distinction between Muslims and non-Muslims. Now Mr. Trump is a, is a symptom of a, of a problem and I, I've, I'm not an American, I don't want to get involved in the debate in America, but what, what you see with communalism and this is very important because it's a, a, a lesson of separate history that the Europeans need to know, is that when you communalize society you see the emergence of extremes. So uh, the extreme right and the extreme right provokes a reaction from the extreme left. So you have, you have actually two forms of, of discord flowing from bicommunalism. You have the discord between the, the so-called two communities who end up at loggerheads and sadly uh, clashing with one another in what the British used to call intercommunal disturbances. So you've got the intercommunal disturbances, which are a product of the intercommunal division. But then within each of the two communities, you see that the emergence of two extremes, extreme left and extreme right. I mean, look at the history of science. And, and federalism is not the answer. Federalism is certainly not the answer. Uh, what but reconciling is, these two. Uh, what, what is the answer? Or is, is it? What federal, federalism just freezes division. 
That's all it does. It freezes the divisions and it tries to produce a system of muddling through where you muddle through from crisis to crisis and hope for the best. And the best never happens. I mean, look at Lebanon. Lebanon is not a federation, but it has a consociational model. They can't come up with a, a president. Belgium has a consociational system. It's a, it's a federation of, of some sort as well. They, they didn't have a government for uh, the best part of two years. Uh, so federalism is really a... Uh, it, why has it come to Cyprus? It's come to Cyprus because Turkey wants federalism. Mm. And that begs the question, why does Turkey want federalism? Well, the declassified American, uh, British and United Nations documents I've seen give us the answer. Uh, Turkey wants a bizonal, bicommunal federation because it does not want double enosis. Doesn't, what, it, what does that mean? It means it does not want the southern part of Cyprus becoming part of Greece, and it doesn't want the northern part of Cyprus, uh, Cyprus becoming, constitutionally at least, part of Turkey. Turkey wants... Historically, though, it did. Uh, historically, it did. And maybe in the longer term, it does. But as an interim measure, what Turkey has, and Turkey thinks in the long term, so 40 years is uh, within the, the mindset of, of, of this Turkish interim mindset. What, the, what, what Turkey wanted back in 1974 was the formation of, of a bizonal, bicommunal federation so that Turkey could, in effect, control the north, but also through the federalism of the governmental arrangements it could have control over the South. And also through the Treaty of Guarantee and the Treaty of Alliance, they could also uh, have a, a military presence uh, in Cyprus. So, I mean, that explains uh, why Turkey wouldn't want uh, some, uh, the settlement to look more like a confederation, uh, where you, you have uh, two peoples, essentially. Because are, are we talking about a single people or two peoples no. in Cyprus uh, you know th yeah. that's part of the that's part of the debate or part of the 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 conflict here uh, but uh, presumably a confederation where you have essentially two states uh, agreeing to cooperate with each other uh, you know and yet uh, we, we, we're not talking about that uh, people don't think that that's a legitimate uh, way forward. Uh, it leads to partition. It leads to, uh, you hear all these arguments and partition is bad. Partition is bad, but by communalism is good. I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit uh, uh, schizophrenic, if you ask me, because uh, the way you explain it, by communalism is partition. Of course it is. It's a, it's a different form of, it's a, by so why not bite the bullet and have, you know, two states amicably cooperating? Christodoule, uh, first of all, um, Turkey has been pumping out a, an ideology for the last uh, 60 years, which I've described as the two peoples in one island thesis. The argument of Turkey is there are two peoples on the island of Cyprus, the Greeks, who are Greek Orthodox, and the Turks who are Muslim. And that means that you have a, a, a divided society at its very, very foundation. What that means is, leave aside democracy and equality and non-discrimination and all of those wonderful principles, or, 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 or not wonderful, all of those principles associated with d democracy. Division is a device for Turkey to meddle. Division is a device for the sovereignty of the republic to be undermined. And division is a device and an excuse for Turkey to uh, seek to assert a, a presence here in Cyprus. Everyone, now I've got to, I want people to listen to this carefully. Uh, there is a massive amount of discussion about the Treaty of Guarantee. I haven't yet encountered, and I may be wrong, I haven't yet encountered much discussion about the Treaty of Alliance, which of course uh, is arguably uh, discredited and uh, is a dead letter. But that's the treaty that gives, under the 1960 uh, version of the treaty, uh, Greece the right to station 950 troops and Turkey the right to station 650 troops. And what the, what the two treaties do, the Treaty of Guarantee and the Treaty of Alliance do, what they do is they 
internationalized by communalism. So you, you have um, the, the internationalization of by communalism and also, also, and this is crucial, the imposition of external actors but on the landscape of the But what we're talking the about then <coughs> And then there are the British who we won't go into. Is in, in the Cyprus case, it's the negation of the nation state. Yes. It is the invention or the process of inventing a binational state. Yeah. Would that be, you would agree that that's an accurate uh, binational and by faith? Fine, but binational if, if nationhood is is defined in certain conditions, and in this case, it has a religious element in it. Sure, uh, because 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 the churches both in the north and in the south are established churches. Yeah, they're not disestablished. So, uh, in, in the end of the day. That's that's the point of the argument. It's is it two people or uh, two peoples or is it uh, two communities of a single society, uh, and and uh, that's a leap of faith in some ways. Um. I, I hate to f to end on that uh, note, and I won't. I'll, I'll give you a <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a chance because the. Uh, I have still the stench of, of uh, segregation in my nostrils. I, I want to get away from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the only way you, the only, w listen, uh, um, I've been influenced by reading the works of Thurgood Marshall yeah. and uh, Martin Luther King, who were the two, two of the leading civil rights advocates in uh, uh, the United States of America. And Thurgood Marshall once made a, a, a simple but telling point. The only way you can attack segregation is to attack segregation. Right. Now, I'm not in favor of violence, but what we do require in the Republic of Cyprus is a non-violent campaign against the segregation that flows from the principle of bicommunalism and the principle of bisonality. Everybody in this island needs to read their history to understand uh, what these two concepts are, what these two concepts entail, why they are so dangerous, and why they need to be dismantled. And what is also needed is a campaign, a, uh, an equivalent of the denazification yeah. campaign that was introduced in Germany after 1945. Instead of funding bicommunal projects, which is what the Americans and the Europeans have been doing now for many, many years, instead of funding bicommunal projects that freeze and perpetuate the bicommunal division of citizens, what the Americans and the Europeans should start doing is introducing de bicommunalization programs yeah, 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 so yeah, that yeah. we can introduce the principles of liberal democracy, so we can educate the public and explain to them what is the rule of law, why does it help you, why does it engender right. a cohesive society. Right. Um, and we also need uh, to instill uh, the principles of ethics and humanity and the enlightenment in this part of the world. Remember, uh, history is really important here, when the Enlightenment was uh, gathering pace in Europe and in North America, Cyprus was under the boot of the Ottoman Empire. When the processes of democratization were gradually unfolding in the United Kingdom in the 19th century, late 19th century and the 20th century, Cyprus was under the boot of the British. And all of a sudden in 1960 there was this uh, sudden emergence of a Republic of Cyprus that was called democratic. But if you look behind the label, it wasn't democratic because it was deeply divided and the citizens hadn't really understood or cherished the meaning of democracy and the meaning of the rule of law. We didn't even have a university in the Republic of Cyprus right. until the early 1990s. And, and therefore, um, what, we, uh, what, we, what we've ended up with is an intellectually impoverished society. Now we have lots of educated people in Cyprus, but I'm talking about the society as a whole. This is an intellectually impoverished society. The impoverishment is a product of imperialism, and the impoverishment has given rise to an unacceptable consequence, which is a lack of affinity with the principles of democracy and the rule of law. And as a result of that, it's so much easier for the leader-led process at the top to try and manipulate people into accepting bicommunalism and bisonality because the people don't have centuries of enlightenment right. and centuries of democratization to tap into to say to themselves, uh-uh, 
this is wrong. This is unacceptable, both in terms of its secretive procedure yeah. and in terms of its prospective uh, substantive. They, they don't have a, a democratic antibodies in other words, no. to, to resist. So uh, would it be fair to say that uh, people who live on this island are, are at a crossroads now? They, they have to choose between uh, a binational state which is, uh, in, in most historical experiences, they, such a thing doesn't work uh, because it, it just doesn't, you can't reconcile uh, the, the, uh, the essence, the, the, the demands of different nation, uh, nations within a single state. Uh, although the multinational empires uh, did work, you know, was, but Cyprus is not a multinational empire. Uh, but at any rate, they, they're at a very critical point that they have to choose between uh, individual rights and human rights and their dignity and uh, uh, perhaps something else. Uh, uh, you, you something darker. <laughs> um, you um, said or you claimed that Cyprus is at a crossroads. Well, it's certainly at a crossroads geographically, geographically but sure. I would rather put it in, in these terms. The citizens of the Republic of Cyprus are standing on the edge of a cliff. Oh. And when you stand on the edge of a cliff, you should remember Aesop's fables. And there's a reason why we were taught Aesop's fables at school. And that's because Aesop's fables contain a number of morals and principles that should guide us throughout life. Aesop taught us, look before you leap. You leap. Well, on that note, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Claire Kevin, thank, thank you, you very much. You're welcome. And hope uh, you can join us next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.